Hi right, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan, and today we continue our How to Survive series by going back to the magical world of Harry Potter. Why do we keep doing Harry Potter videos? Well, when I'm sitting on my couch writing scripts, there's always Harry Potter marathons on cable TV. For those of you youngins out there who don't know what cable TV is, this was an old-fashioned technology where the little people inside of the TV box get to decide what you watch and when you watch. The Harry Potter movies also bring me back to my childhood. And for all of you youngins out there who don't understand what a childhood is, it's that terrifying period of time you're undergoing right now that will eventually shape how messed up of an adult you will become. But yeah, as a kid I didn't do well in school, and I hated my teachers, and I thought school was boring and pointless. And it kinda was, I mean I do YouTube now. But Hogwarts was always a really cool alternative a world I could escape into. On top of that, Harry Potter, Garfield Comics, and ESPN Magazine fulfilled my summer reading requirements. But I was a stupid kid. Where I saw magic and adventure, now as an adult, I only see a poorly run school full of children running around with the magical equivalent of handguns. Which is why we're gonna have to teach you how to survive Hogwarts. And because Hogwarts, or going to Hogwarts, is not really a battle, more like an ongoing war, we're gonna change up the format a little bit from our usual episodes. Now, one of the first things you'll experience when you come to Hogwarts is the sorting ceremony. A lot of youngins get anxiety about this process because the house you're chosen to join will greatly affect who you're going to be around and live with for the next seven years, if you don't die in the process. But the truth is, you actually have some say in the matter, and you can help suggest to the hat which house you would rather be in. For instance, during my sorting ceremony, the hat told me I was either Ravenclaw material or Gryffindor material. I obviously chose Gryffindor knowing the houses pretty well. And if you do get the opportunity to choose houses, I recommend you do the same. Now, on this channel, we talk a lot about not being a hero and getting yourself into unnecessarily risky situations. But that doesn't mean you don't want to surround yourself with heroes, especially in a place as dangerous as Hogwarts. Now, Gryffindor is considered the house known for courage, bravery, and kindness. These are the kind of qualities you want to look for in your friends, but this also means your fellow housemates will be constantly breaking the rules. But just because something is a rule doesn't necessarily mean it's going to protect you from anything. Uh, a lot of times rules are created by very, very stupid people, and then there are also rules that were created to prevent stupid people from hurting themselves. Generally, Gryffindor students are smart enough to determine which rules are the stupid ones and pointless to follow. For instance, it's a good idea to venture out as much as possible and explore the school grounds even after hours, because Hogwarts is full of secrets in hidden areas that might help your overall goal to survive. Another great thing about Gryffindor students is they're not very likely to shoot up the place. Which unfortunately is something you have to worry about because everyone has a freaking wand. And a good percentage of the student body are hormonal moody teenagers. The Slytherin kids are going to be the most ambitious and most likely to mess with you or try to sabotage whatever you're doing. But they most likely won't murder you. But if they don't like you, they will beat you within an inch of your life. Plus, all those crazy ambitious Slytherins will feed off of each other, creating a really unpleasant environment. But being in Slytherin might help you be prepared for what the real world will actually be like. Ravenclaw is going to be full of the most brilliant and intelligent and consequently also the most mentally unbalanced, disconnected, and low empathy individuals. Ravenclaws treasure intelligence and rationale over human feelings and emotions. And to be honest, Ravenclaw scares me more than any of the other houses. For one, their house is structured with almost no rules because they believe in self-governance. Ravenclaws are very likely to have a superiority complex and feel disconnected with the rest of the student population due to their higher intelligence. They're also more likely to dehumanize their fellow classmates and see them more as playthings rather than human beings. If the undead suddenly rises from the graveyards of Hogsmeade, it might be a Slytherin, but just as easily a Ravenclaw. But what makes a Ravenclaw more dangerous than a Slytherin is that Slytherins are pretty predictable. They're ambitious and want power, but Ravenclaws are generally just bored and looking for something to do. Hufflepuff is nice, I guess, if you just want to hang around and coexist. They are the most accepting house. Think woke and PC individuals that are actually tolerable and not trying to control the entire world and how other people think. 
Everyone in Hufflepuff will be very pleasant, but if things do go down, you're also going to be surrounded by a bunch of hippies who might not be the best at fighting. The reality is Hogwarts is going to be a dangerous place, and even if you are extremely competent and careful, you most likely will face death numerous times during your time there. Whether it's Hagrid's magical creatures class, or a potion mixing experiment gone wrong, or some ill-advised past curfew adventure into the depths of the castle, there is basically no way to prevent yourself from facing danger unless you lock yourself in the common room and don't really want to have any fun. At that rate, you're probably better off going back to your own boring school in the real world. So if danger is going to happen no matter what, surround yourself with heroes that can save you. Now the problem of course is not all of us can join Gryffindor. Some of us are truly cowards. And it's usually the ones that talk a really big game. But in order to be surrounded by heroes, you'll also have to give back a little bit. Most of us do have a little bit of Gryffindor inside ourselves, we just need to find it. So it's perfectly reasonable to try to join Gryffindor and kind of grow into that position. Now some classes in Hogwarts are useless, others are interesting, and some are mandatory if you want to stay alive. In your first year of Hogwarts, you'll have to take Transfiguration, Charms, Potions, History of Magic, Defense Against the Dark Arts, Astronomy, and Herbology. Astronomy is meh, and the history of magic is interesting, but it's the other five you're really going to want to focus on. Especially events against the dark arts and charms. Learning how to use the shield charm Protego is a good start, along with some more offensive spells like Stupefy, which can stun, and Expelliarmus, which can disarm an opponent. Although disarming someone is kind of unnecessary, you're better off just knocking them out. Study your spellbook constantly and practice your incantations and wand movements until everything becomes second nature. You'll never know when a werewolf breaks into the castle or a ravenclaw loses it and starts using the forbidden curse on people in the lunchroom. You shouldn't have to think about what spells you're going to use. You should be firing them instinctively at any threat. Again, I cannot stress how dangerous Hogwarts is. Everyone above the age of 11 is carrying essentially a gun. Now, there are certain spells and magic you can't really learn about until you're older. Some are just completely forbidden. But again, you should view each rule independently and decide whether you want to break them or not. The ability to operate will get you away from the most dangerous situations, whether it's avoiding an incoming spell momentarily so you can counterattack, or just vanishing to another side of the country. Now, technically, you need a license to operate. This was started sometime in the 1920s. You see, apparating is quite difficult to pull off, and if you mess up, you might leave a part of your body behind. If you are caught by the Ministry of Magic, you might be fine, but I'd rather take a fine than get eaten by a basilisk. So instead of spending your first year in Hogwarts looking up the sky in astronomy class, do something useful with your time, maybe even learn a Forbidden Curse. The Imperious Curse is a pretty cool one. It allows you to control other people. The Cruciatus Curse is for the sick individual who likes torturing people. But Avada Kedavra, the Killing Curse, is the one that's worth learning. Like we keep saying for the millionth time, every student has a wand, and if one starts going crazy, you're gonna want a little extra stopping power. After all, if you get into a gunfight, if your enemy is firing live rounds at you, you're not gonna fire back at them with non-lethal rubber bullets. Plus, there are plenty of larger foes that just simply can't be stunned away. Now, that's not to say you should be using Forbidden Curses willy-nilly, because that will attract a lot of attention, and that will decrease your chance of survival, for sure. There are also hundreds of lesser known spells and charms that can go a long way to surprise your foe or potential attacker. So if there is anything you should obsess over, it's being great with your wand. Hermione had the right idea. This is a great responsibility and you really owe to yourself. If you decide to go to somewhere as dangerous as Hogwarts, you gotta be prepared. Now, another class you'll be forced to take as a young wizard or witch is Broom Flying Class. It essentially is like driver's ed for magical people. Honestly, though, I would stay away from Broom Flying. It's kind of like riding a motorcycle. It's definitely a superior way of traveling around. It's a lot more fun. You can see the world in spectacular ways, but it's also not the safest form of transportation. Definitely learn how to fly a broom, but you're probably better off learning other ways of moving around using magic. Also, stay away from Quidditch. That game is a death wish. I would recommend any new student of Hogwarts try to get their hands on the Marauder's Map or an Invisibility Cloak. But then again, not everyone is Harry Potter. The Marauder's Map is basically a map of the entire school that shows where everyone is. It's useful for sneaking around and probably not impossible to make. Might be worth looking into. The Invisibility Cloak is on another level of magic and most likely will be very hard to get. It's considered one of the Deathly Hollows, and supposedly it was gifted to a wizard by the Grim Reaper himself if you believe in that sort of thing. But there are other types of spells and potions that can conceal your appearance if you need to. 
And even without the Marauder's Map, it's still possible to learn about all the secrets and hidden passages in the castle. To do so, you just need to befriend the individuals that no one else notices, like the house elves, ghosts, and the paintings. They're part of Hogwarts as well, and most have been there longer than even the headmaster and teachers. If you can gain their trust, you'll gain access to all of Hogwarts' secrets. Lastly, if you do want to join some extracurricular activity, I recommend starting an illegal paramilitary organization, especially when you have maniacs like Voldemort or Grindelwald running around. Find trusted and talented individuals and train with them. This way you can get better at dueling and at the same time develop some trusted allies. The idea is no matter where you are in Hogwarts, should something crazy go down like a wild animal attack, you'll have backup, or at least someone who can distract the threat while you carefully run away. Magic is dangerous, and should you choose the path of becoming a wizard or witch, make sure you are prepared. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben. How to survive? That has been the question of man throughout time as essential resources on Earth are finite, and even if we figure out how to clone things, a giant ball of fire in the sky grows larger by the day and will eventually envelop our planet, lest Elon Musk does something about it. Of course, humans aren't worried about the sun's murderous intent when a number of other more mundane dangers threaten their lives on a daily basis. You know, disease, car crashes, anvils falling from the sky, and other stuff. People have to be careful out there. Humans are fragile. And in the world of science fiction, where there's xenomorphs and Sith Lords, one must be extra cautious as to not meet a premature demise. And then on top of all that, The Expanse's universe is possibly the most dangerous of all, as it's highly realistic relative to other science fiction. And thus, plot armor ain't gonna cut it. So for those of you dwelling in the various civilizations throughout the solar system, I want to provide for you a service that might help you survive among stars fraught with conflict and some seriously scary shit. Excuse my language to the kids out there. Here's 10 rules for surviving the expanse. The first rule is the most obvious and the most important. Stay away from the protomolecule. Simple as that. Everything else on this list can be linked to this rule in some way. Pursue this mysterious alien agent and you're likely going to have a bad day. Do not fall victim to the allure of the protomolecule's potential and power, as so many do in so many different ways. The pursuit of the protomolecule is representative of man's inability to hold himself back from technological progress. Scientists indulge their passion, seeking to experiment on the protomolecule at the cost of the dangers such innovation might beget, and in doing so often end up dying in one way or another. We even see non-scientists attempt to get closer to the protomolecule and its related entities out of their personal curiosities, and so too perish for it. And then there are everyday people who seek to take advantage of the exploration that the protomolecule's ring gate system allows for, and also put their lives in jeopardy. This rule can also be restated as restrain your hubris. In the face of great and unknown forces in the universe, both of nature and otherwise, man has rarely shown the ability to proceed with caution and respect the relative fragility of his own being. And with that said, the second rule is don't be a hero, unless you want to die as one, that is. If you look for trouble in the soul system, you will likely find it. No one really wants to talk about this, but had the crew of the Cant listened to Captain McDowell and ignored the distress signal from the Scopuli, they'd be alive today. But Jimmy Holden had to play hero and get everyone killed. Same thing with the Doniger. Captain Yao should have ignored the Knight's distress signal and moved on, but they came to save the ship and investigate the Canterbury's destruction. Yes, it was probably the dutiful thing to do, but... Not the best idea if the crew wanted to stay alive. Of course, Hubris also contributed to the defeat of the Doniger, as Captain Yao did not prepare with desperation in thinking her ship superior to those of the approaching enemies. Then, the crew of the Merasmus broke this rule, of course, in delivering aid to the survivors of the Eros outbreak, which also brought them in proximity of the protomolecule, which again often means death is coming one way or another. Don't just avoid heroism either. Actively stay out of trouble. Don't pull a Souther and refuse to obey orders. As a matter of fact, don't even pull a Grigori and even question orders. Head down, do your job, and stay quiet, and you just might live to see another day yet. In the Expanse, you rise up and reject authority. You're bound to die for it. This brings us to our third rule, which is don't be bad or consort with nefarious people. This is another obvious one. While heroism will get you killed, so will doing bad things. It seems that there is some sort of karmic system in the Expanse by which those who commit 
evil and unjust acts will eventually pay for it. Esai actually turns out not to be that bad of a guy, but his illicit dealings eventually result in his death. Cohen seems to be a nice enough dude as well, but his subversion of the Rosinante systems for the purpose of transmitting a fake and malicious message leads somewhat indirectly to his eventual death by freak accident. Similarly, Kenzo's deceit and ruinous intentions aboard the Rosinante eventually result in his demise on Eros. Also, once again, stay away from the protomolecule. Our fourth rule is don't fall in with the OPA, unless you're okay with dying. The OPA expects that every belter in its ranks commit his life to the mission, and if needed, sacrifice himself for the greater good. And that's not really a recipe for survival, especially when the belt is the inferior state in the soul system. I mean, OPA members frequently throw themselves in harm's way for the slightest of reasons, hoping to die honorable deaths rather than live out long, cowardly lives. Trust me, my friends, the latter option is better. Live on and live well. Though, if you are really tired of Fast and Furious sequels, I can kind of understand wanting to check out early. Rule number five is unless you are a belter, stay away from the belt. Belters have been oppressed for ages and look upon inners with disdain. Sure, there are non-belters who live in the belt, and on a daily basis they live mostly in peace, but any sort of unrest that flares up could lead belters to target such people first. Furthermore, given their rough upbringings, belters are much more desensitized to violence than inners, and thus are capable of inflicting injury or death on foes or simply people they don't like with little hesitation. Inners are not cut out for belter society. Though belters are easy to escape, you just go down to the surface of a planet. Rule number six is do not trust politicians or other government officials. The Expanse's universe is one in which most humans live under massive centralized government bureaucracies that breed intrigue and corruption. To thrive within such entities, individuals must act in a Machiavellian manner. Even good-natured leaders must engage in underhanded tactics at times. Thus, to survive in the world of the Expanse, one should never take the word of any official to be the truth, and rather think as to a person's intentions in order to interpret their actions. Furthermore, no official should ever underestimate how far another would go in order to win. Not even a powerful diplomat is protected from murder should his death offer something to gain by his enemy. Rule number seven is that mercy can get you killed. Okay, maybe this hits back at the whole idea of a karmic system. Letting your enemies live might be the humane thing to do at times, but in a system fraught with intense conflict, where individuals are conditioned to be fanatically dedicated to one state, often mercy is not enough to overwhelm an enemy's hostility. Kleiss Ashford lets a captured Martian naval officer aboard the Tynan live, and one of his crew members is murdered for it. Kamina let Marco and Naros go free, and this time Kleiss Ashford himself is the victim of her calculated mercy. Of course, Kleiss Ashford also broke the cardinal rule of don't be a hero and go looking for trouble. Rule number eight is stay away from the Brodo molecule. No, 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 not Proto molecule, Brodo molecule, aka Amos Burton. Don't screw him, well, you can screw him, but don't screw with him. And definitely don't mess with his friends or you will very likely die. As a matter of fact, stay as far away from Naomi Nagata as possible as well. One wrong blink in her direction could mean death. Creepy doctors beware, Amos is that guy. On that note, rule number nine, and this is highly important, do not get into a fist fight with Bobby Draper. Martian Marines are dangerous. Bobby Draper is lethal. 9.6 out of 10.1 doctors agree her right hook is a more effective sleep aid than Ambien. If you're going to try and take Bobby on, you're going to have to catch her without her armor and use a firearm from a significant distance. Do not go hand to hand with this woman. You will lose. And if you find yourself in close proximity to her and you've pissed her off, either do what she says or run, or the People's Marine is gonna lay the smack of down. Once again, don't be a hero, don't be bad, don't fight Gundams, live a long life, capiche? Rule number 10 is own your own ship. Ultimately, almost everyone in the Expanse's universe lives in constant danger. Such is the nature of life amidst constant and widespread conflict carried out by corrupt and megalomaniacal leaders. Denizens of Earth often live in desperate poverty, Martians are all tools of the state, and well, belters. The best way to survive in the soul system is to live under no master. 
Life on the surface of a planet leaves one vulnerable to the effects of his leader's decisions. So you could then join the military and live aboard a space vessel, but this often means putting one's life in danger for the state, a la the Doniger. The people who are in the best position to survive in the Sol system are those who chart their own destinies. The crew of the Rocinante really has it best. They have their own ship, which flies under no flag, and are beholden to no orders but their own. Now they choose on their own to break almost all of the rules on this list, save for fighting Bobby Draper, who would probably knock out the Rocinante in a punch, but they don't have to do this. They could steer the Rocinante far from harm's way and live in relative peace floating around the Sol system, gathering resources as needed. So that's the best way to go. You have to own your own ship and keep mobile. Living under the rule of one of the major powers will ultimately result in you being forced to break rules on this list against your will. Finally, rule number 11 is be good at science. Seriously, the Expanse's realistic universe does not allow for YOLO-type madness. You can't always muscle your way to victory or get by without expertise. The people best prepared to survive in the Sol system are those who understand engineering, physics, mathematics, and other scientific disciplines. You have to know how to fix your ship. You have to know how to treat injuries in zero-g. You have to be a master botanist. Okay, not sure on that last one, but still, you get the point. You can't just know how to kick ass. You have to be educated and know how things work in order to survive and thrive. Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan, and today I want to continue our How to Survive series with probably one of the coolest battles I've seen in recent years, uh, the invasion of Normandy in Edge of Tomorrow. Not to be confused with the actual invasion of Normandy during World War II, that was done by real people who were just heroic at another level. I could never imagine myself having the courage to do something as crazy as that. Although I just started watching The Man in the High Castle, which shows a terrifying alternate reality where the Nazis and Japanese win the war and occupy America. It's given me second thoughts about risking your life for a greater cause. Anyway, Edge of Tomorrow is more like an origin story for how Tom Cruise was granted blood magic by Scientology, which allows him to never die. That's why he's a badass and doing crazy stuff all the time. Also, we talk about this a lot on our channel. There's uh, something called method acting, and then there's Tom Cruise acting, which isn't acting, but just real life. Everything in Tom Cruise movies are real, thanks to the power of Scientology. Anyway, with our intro out of the way, let's continue to the actual video. It will be separated into four segments. First, the background about the battle, then uh, some information about the enemy combatants, then a breakdown of the equipment and training you'll need to survive, followed by what you actually need to do to survive. Let's begin. This section of the video is for all of you grunts who fall asleep at the briefing and then don't realize where they are and who they're shooting at when they finally get their ass kicked out of the dropship. I appreciate your carefree attitude, but please stop it now and listen up. The Human Mimic War starts in the future, in 2056, after a hostile alien species invades Earth. Remember kids, extraterrestrial aliens are always hostile, and those who try to connect with them and humanize them are betraying us all. Kill it with fire. The Mimics arrive in a cluster of asteroids and mostly land in Western Europe, mostly in France. Human forces experience defeat after defeat in the face of this alien onslaught, forcing NATO, China, and Russia eventually to transform into the United Defense Force. Finally, humans are able to drop all of their petty differences and join together in a truly united humanity. How's that humanity first? This is basically the only good thing that ever happens when the aliens arrive and start eating our children. Like an Independence Day when the Iraqi and Israeli pilots join forces. Brings tears to my eyes. At the end of the day, you guys all love Cuba, which is basically an Iraqi form of dumplings that is delicious. Israelis, Arabs, Muslims, Jews, we're all human beings and we all love dumplings. Just look at all the cultures in the world. There are all types of Asian dumplings. There's Polish dumplings, British dumplings, South African dumplings, North Korean dumplings, Jamaican dumplings, Jersey Shore dumplings, Spanish dumplings. The list just goes on. Anyway, despite humanity's newfound connection and realization that we can be united by food, the mimics were kicking our dumpling eating asses into oblivion. Until that is, the Battle of Verdun occurs. Yes, the same Verdun that was the location for one of the most costly battles of World War I. The UDF were finally able to defeat the Mimics in this battle because of two major reasons. Well, maybe three, actually. 
One was the recent deployment of the combat jacket exoskeletons, and two, Sergeant Reed Vratsky went on a kill streak of about a thousand mimics and was given the very fitting title of Angel of Verdun. Little did humanity know, the Angel of Verdun actually had found a cheat code and it basically allowed her to respawn every time she died. The mimics also wanted us to win this battle purposely because they wanted us to get overconfident and engage all of our forces in a ill-advised offensive. General Brigham, the commander of the UDF, falls right into this trap and launches an all-out cross-channel invasion called Operation Downfall. The goal is to retake France. Probably not the best name for an invasion It's kind of foreshadowing a pretty big defeat. Probably should have called it Overlord 2 or something like that. But I guess that's what you get with General Brigham, who is actually the father of General Hux, their military family not really known for their brilliance. Another interesting fact is Operation Downfall is actually the name of the planned invasion of the Japanese mainland, which thankfully never had to happen. One of the reasons why the UDF wanted to launch Operation Downfall was to give the Russians and Chinese forces some relief on the Eastern Front. I know this is starting to sound a lot like World War II, but remember, we're not just facing goose-stepping, sexually confused fascists, we're actually facing an existential threat to all of humanity, so pay attention. The goal of Operation Downfall was to establish a beachhead by using a massive infantry-led invasion to retake the Normandy beach area. Thousands of quad tilt rotors would drop thousands of combat jacket-equipped soldiers in your classic human wave frontal assault. As Dr. Carter, a Mimic specialist, once explained, the Mimics were basically the perfect world-conquering organism. They lay dormant in asteroids for God knows how long until they ran into a planet full of life forms and then just took over. Although that does seem a bit random and a little bit too 40k universe for me, it's because the galaxy is massive, and if there is life out there, it's most likely pretty spread out. So in my opinion, I think the Mimics had to specifically aim at Earth, or at least guide themselves towards the planet that had life on it. Otherwise, the Mimics would just be constantly floating into black holes and stars and all that other junk. It's hard to describe what exactly a Mimic is. The best term to use would be shapeshifter. If you've played games like Prey recently, you'll know what I mean. The Mimic bodies are made of these kind of moving coils of particles that seem to be constantly changing and flexing. That is, if you're fast enough to track their movement with your eyes. They move at inhuman speeds and are incredibly powerful. They can easily rip a man and an exoskeleton in half. So they're definitely strong and fast enough to move in close and get that melee kill on you almost every time. And yes, this movie is based on Japanese manga, which is why they have tentacles. If you aren't familiar with Japanese art forms, I definitely recommend you guys check it out. It's completely unique and very different from anything we have here in the United States. And I think because the Japanese are historically an island people, their numerous encounters with sea monsters have given their culture an underlying fear and fascination with tentacles. Also, some mimics could fire projectiles, which helped them defend against larger vehicles and aerial attacks. Killing the mimics usually required a massive amount of kinetic force, either through the use of traditional firearms or explosives, and in the Angel of Verdun's case, a giant buster sword. You know what, before we continue, I really have to say this, we definitely need to see Edge of Tomorrow 2. I need more of this. A lot more of this. Anyway, there are three Mimic types that we know of first. The Drone Mimic, which is by far the most common variant. It's hard to say how large it is because it's constantly shifting in size, but let's just say it's in between the size of a large lion and a smart car. The drones mainly use their tentacles to kill their foes, but they also can fire projectiles out of their backs. They seem animalistic in nature, but are quite intelligent. During the invasion of Normandy Beach, several of them have dug themselves into bombed out craters where they waited to ambush UDF soldiers who took cover in those craters. Aside from their constantly moving exteriors, they also had a reddish glow inside which actually gave them away at night. When they are killed, their entire body petrifies and the glow goes away. Next, we're going to be talking about the very rare Alpha Mimic. According to Dr. Carter, 1 in 6.18 million Mimics were actually an Alpha variant. They were much larger than a drone, roughly the size of a bus, and terrifying to look at. Besides being a lot larger and more terrifying than the average drone, the Alpha played an important part in the Mimic army and served as the eyes and ears for the Omega Mimic. Anytime an Alpha Mimic was killed, something in their blood allowed them to revert time back to an earlier date and still retain all of their knowledge of what happened. 
This means that they will know about the enemy's movements and actions should the mimics be defeated in one way or another. When humans like Rita or Cage get exposed to this blood, it burns them like acid, killing them, but it also gives them this power to revert time as well. And as long as they don't lose their blood without dying, like with a blood transfusion, they'll have that power forever. Now, there seems to be only one Omega mimic in every invasion, and they basically are the hive mind that controls everything. The Omega has the ability to reset time, so every time it fails, it can just revert time and try a new battle tactic until it wins. It's kind of like me when I'm playing XCOM. I know that the final mission to the alien main base is going to be hard, but you know, I've been through so much with Dolph Lundgren and Bruce Willis to just leave them behind. The Omega is basically just a giant glowing blob. It's well hidden, but ultimately defenseless. Kill it and you win the war. But if you want to survive, don't volunteer to kill it. Let Tom Cruise do it. Now, usually there's a lot of things to talk about uh, when it comes to this section, but if you're in the UDF and you're in the infantry combat jacket, it's basically the only thing you really need to worry about. Seriously, besides the quad tilt rotors, there are almost no other vehicles in sight during the Battle of Normandy. No tanks, no giant mechs, no artillery, no anything. But in truth, the combat jackets are pretty awesome and they can do a lot. For one, it seems like Elon Musk has figured out how to make electric batteries not suck by 2050. And we as human beings have basically mounted almost every weapon imaginable to this gigantic exoskeleton platform. On your right wrist, most suits have a modified FN SCAR heavy variant assault rifle, which has a grenade launcher attached below it. Then on your left hand, you have a triple barreled anti-armor cannon, along with a grenade launcher and an auto cannon mounted on struts on your shoulders. Weapon aside, the best part of a combat jacket is it gives the wearer increased mobility and strength. This allows them to survive jumps from extreme heights, pick up large objects, run and jump faster and further, but unfortunately at the Battle of Normandy, these suits still seem kind of new, and most of the UDF soldiers aren't even aware of how capable their suits are, and are just kind of using them as weapons carriers. If you want to survive this crazy war, definitely find some time to train on how to use this suit until it becomes second nature. Because mobility is key in this battle and that suit will keep you safe. From an armor standpoint, the combat jackets have very little protection, especially against projectiles or stabby stabby tentacles. Now, there are some heavier variants of the combat jacket, but I argue that the mimics were so powerful that dodging their attacks is a much better alternative. There were some upgraded suits that had really cool weapons on them. For instance, one suit would replace the Scar H on your wrist and replace it with something known as a dual angel railgun. Don't know what it is, but it sounds awesome. Remember, the more firepower, the better in this scenario, as long as it doesn't slow you down. Shapeshifters are great at absorbing damage, so try to hit them with something with a lot of damage. Look, this entire battle is basically an ambush. Like, the mimics know you're coming, and there's basically no way to really survive long term. You just have to survive long enough so that Tom Cruise can destroy the Omega, which will reset everything, which then means the battle will never happen, which means you don't have to worry about surviving anyway. But then we won't have a video, so we're just going to tell you what to do anyway. First, don't be afraid of heights. Be fully aware of how to disengage your suit from its berth while you're in the quad tilt rotor. I would say try to be the closest man to the jump door, but in this case, the floor just drops out, so you're all very close. Do not hesitate when that happens because your suit is only designed to absorb impacts from certain directions, and that does not include the ship exploding in your face. Once you make it to the ground, remember saving Private Ryan and get off the beach. One, because there is no cover, and two, the Mimics have prepared some really good air defenses, which means there's going to be a lot of debris falling around you. Now, as we mentioned before, there are going to be a lot of Mimics in these bombed out craters all around you, and should you go into one of these craters for cover, I recommend you use some explosives to make the foxhole deeper, and also to draw any Mimics that might be hiding there. Since Mimics are mostly melee fighters, try to always keep distance between you and them. Most of the UDF soldiers don't seem to understand how to fully use their suit, but don't let their ignorance be your excuse. Because excuses won't prevent you from dying. Learn how to create distance and constantly duck and weave while firing at the enemy's center mass. The Scar H has some great stopping power against humans, but it's a lot less powerful when you're using it against a Mimic. With their constantly shifting molecular structure, it requires a little more than just bullets to take them down, usually. Instead, use the Scar H like how Muhammad Ali uses his jab. It's not designed to kill a mimic, but it'll keep it at bay and hopefully off balance. 
Once you get it stumbling around enough, line up the perfect shot with your heavier weapon and take it out. I don't recommend going all Angel Verdun on the Mimics. Buster Swords are really cool back at the base when you're just strutting around with that thing like a badass, but once you're in the middle of a battle and you only have a giant sword on you, you're gonna regret it. I'm pretty sure Rita just got bored of not dying, so she decided to challenge herself by maxing out her melee skill tree. But if you don't have respawns and Mimic Blood in you, I definitely don't recommend going this route. Also, when fighting drones, keep in mind if they do fire projectiles at you, they have to be completely still when they're doing it. So if you do see a Mimic become uncharacteristically still, most likely they're preparing to fire at you. And no, not even the heaviest armor can stop these rounds, so you can either take cover or try to blast it before it blasts you. Although I don't recommend the latter. Now, if you do see an Alpha, this will be the one time in this series, I do recommend you strap on some Claymores or C4 to your body and just try to give it a hug. If you can get that alien juice on you, you'll be good to go and you won't need this guide at all. Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan and today we're going to be bringing over a series we started on Generation Tech over to this channel. It's called How to Survive, and we take a deep dive into various dangerous scenarios in films and TV shows and break down the best way to survive. We'll be kicking off this series on Generation Films with our favorite most hated moon in the galaxy, Pandora, from Avatar. Just a reminder before we start. This video is not about being a hero or even being honorable. This is a video about being practical and preserving one's life above all else. We actually do encourage cowardice. Because we care about all you people out there, humanity does not need any heroes. Leave that kind of stuff up to the guys with plot armor. This video will be split up into four different categories. First, we'll be looking at the background of the battlefield, then the enemies that you might face, along with what kind of equipment and training you should bring, and finally ending up with what exactly you should do to survive. Pandora is the fifth moon of the gas giant Polyphemus, which orbits the star Alpha Centauri A. The Alpha Centauri star system is the closest one to our own local system, at only 4.3 light years away. Pandora's atmosphere is around 20% denser than ours and contains similar gases like oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide, but the carbon dioxide levels are too high for humans and just 20 seconds of exposure can cause you to black out. There's also a high level of hydrogen sulfide on the planet, which is also very deadly. Pandora has roughly the same diameter as our own planet, but only 72% of its mass, and it also has 20% lower gravity. These two factors greatly affect how things evolved and move around on this moon. Pandora is covered in several different genomes, including narrow seas, mountains, jungles, forests, and plains. The fauna and flora on this planet are extremely diverse and much larger than what you would normally see on Earth. This could be due to Pandora's rich and dense atmosphere. It is rumored that some hidden neural network connects all life on this planet to some larger organic entity. Pandora also has an abundance of bioluminescent plants, far brighter than anything we have here on Earth. Beneath its surface, Pandora possessed an extremely rare metal known as unobtainium. It was a room temperature superconductor and could also project a strong magnetic field. The metal was also commonly used in the matter annihilation reactors that powered humanity's starships. Without unobtainium, humanity would not be able to build the ships necessary to make us into a true space-faring race. The locals on the planet, known as the Navi, were quite primitive operating with Stone Age level technology. They had no use for unobtainium, but they did construct their houses and villages near or on top of large deposits of this metal. When the Resources Development Administration landed on Pandora seeking to mine this unobtainium, they naturally ran into some problems with the natives. The Navi were a hunting and gathering society which operated on a completely different wavelength from humanity. They were initially very hard to communicate with. The RDA eventually made some inroads and was even able to establish a school to teach young Navi human culture and the English language. But still, negotiating for mining rights with the Navi was next to impossible. The Navi on the planet numbered only in the millions despite the planet's large size and abundant resources. This meant that there was plenty of room for the Navi and humans to coexist peacefully, but Navi society had yet evolved beyond the tribal stage and the idea of property rights were still quite alien to them. Plus, much of their spiritual belief systems were tied to worshipping trees and their roots, which meant that they were pretty attached to certain locations, especially in places with large unobtainium deposits. 
Now, it's unsure who started the first skirmish or fired the first arrow or bullets between the humans and the Na'vi. But soon after, the RDA convoys regularly came under attack by Na'vi warriors who were unhappy by humanity's presence on the moon. The RDA naturally retaliated and killed many of these hunters. Some of them were only teenagers. Although the Na'vi individually operated as tribes and certain tribes had better relations with the humans than others, the Na'vi hunters were now considered hostile and should be approached with caution. Although the Na'vi lacked technology in an advanced society, they were extremely in tune with their surroundings. They even had evolved a biological tether of sorts that allowed them to connect and mate with each other and even animals. This kind of intimacy might seem weird to humans, and that's because it is. Humans don't mount a horse before they mount a horse. I mean, you could do that, but I'm pretty sure that's animal abuse or something. Thanks to the low gravity on the planet, the Navi can grow up to 12 feet or 16 kilometers in height and can weigh easily over 500 pounds or 10 kilograms. Their skeleton frames are actually reinforced with a carbon fiber-like material, making them extremely durable. Combined with the thicker air density on the planet, the Navi routinely jump down from the tree canopies, using only leaves and branches to slow their descent. The Navi also had a long tail, which helped balance them when they were climbing or jumping from tree to tree. At close ranges, the Navi were extremely deadly and many times stronger than a human being. The Navi also used primitive bows that were scaled up to their size which means their bows were close to the size of a ballista and fired arrows the size of spears, which is as terrifying as it sounds. If that's not bad enough, the Navi also had two distinct mounts that they rode into battle. First, there were the dire horses, which were six-legged mounts that resembled earth horses, but were closer to the size of an African elephant. They could reach a speed of around 60 miles per hour, or 2.3 metric light years per millimeter. Now, for aerial travel, the Navi relied on the mountain banshee. The Navi used their neurological connection to mate with the banshee during flight, which gave them a level of intimacy and control over what they were riding that most of us could never achieve without burning ourselves on a hot engine manifold. First and foremost, always inspect your breathing equipment on Pandora. Without it, you were completely screwed within seconds. The standard issue exo pack consists of a full face mask that is sealed and a small pack which contains a battery and filter that scrubs out the high level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. These filters can last around two weeks and can be cleaned by hand. Still, it's a good idea to bring a backup filter or battery or even emergency rebreather. The exo pack faceplate is made out of perspex, which is a pretty tough material. But bringing some vacuum tape to seal any potential breaches is still a good idea. Before we even get to fighting the Navi, if the variety of different terrifying predators don't kill you, the elements will. As we mentioned in our video where we covered trench warfare on Mimbam, keeping your feet and your gear dry is pretty important if you want to prevent trench feet and other diseases. Pandora is a pretty humid planet, so dressing appropriately is very important. Always bring some backup socks and gear in case you do get wet. And also bring something like a hammock that can keep you elevated and off the ground at night. No one wants to be woken up by a viper wolf or a flash flood. Also, this might seem kind of silly, but there are clear signs that Pandora's environment is almost sentient and aware of your presence. Be respectful to nature and maybe he won't mess with you back. Fire at nighttime, contrary to what you might think, is a bad idea and can attract predators to you instead of repelling them. Brush up on your survival training and also try to learn about all the local flora and fauna so you know what exactly you can touch and what not to piss off. As a member of the RDA security squad on planet, aside from your exo pack, you'll also be given a standard loadout that most Earth militaries at the time would be deployed with, including an ammo and armor carrier, a rifle, and some basic survival equipment. The RDA uses standard firearms, which are quite effective against the Navi and some of the smaller wildlife on Pandora. The RDA does equip its soldiers occasionally with repulsor pods, which can keep away larger life forms, but it's always a good idea to carry a weapon that has a larger caliber round, just in case you run into a larger predatory animal like a Thanator. I would also recommend ditching your body armor. It's not like anyone's going to be firing bullets at you. And if you're going to get hit by a giant Navi arrow, there's really nothing that can save you anyway. Might as well save on the weight and carry more food and munitions. The most dangerous operations carried out by the RDA security forces would be the convoy support patrols. The RDA runs large bulldozers and hell trucks to pave new roads from the main RDA base to new unobtaining deposits. 
This naturally pisses off the Navi and usually attracts some negative attention from them. Usually the Navi will fire at an RDA convoy for sport, but sometimes more determined groups of hunters can stop and set entire convoys on fire, usually massacring any security forces guarding it. If you are unlucky enough to be sent on one of these patrols, I do recommend getting raided to operate an AMP exoskeleton suit. These giant walking mechanical tanks will give you additional armor, another layer of glass that will separate you from the dangerous atmosphere, and the giant blue monkeys trying to turn you into a shish kebab. Ideally, you're going to want to be assigned to the main RDA base on guard duty. The Navi generally are not stupid enough to bum rush the front gates of the main RDA base. Should you find yourself a part of a long-range patrol or an assault mission that takes you into the deep jungle, once again try to get yourself operating an AMP suit. It'll keep you alive a lot longer. And if you are on foot, stay close to the AMPs. They generally will attract and deter any large wildlife, and they can be used as cover against Navi arrows. Make sure you stay close to your group at all times and keep your eyes scanning the tree canopies. This is going to be a very vertical battle, and the enemy is uniquely adapted to swinging amongst the trees. If leading the patrol, try to stay away from heavy underbrush. Keep the area around you clear to lengthen your line of sight. A lot of animals in the Pandoran jungle will take a lot of rounds to take down. As a matter of fact, if I was in charge, I would avoid any kind of ground operations at all until a heavy amount of ordnance was first dumped on the landing zone. White phosphorus and napalm are pretty good at clearing away wildlife. Now, when you guys first arrived to Pandora, you might be stunned by the natural beauty and exotic landscapes, but make sure you do pay attention to have your senses with you because this is a very dangerous place. Hello and welcome back to an episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben. I look around the world today and I see so much fear mongering and the anger it begets. Everyone in some way seems to believe that they and everything they love are under attack and that evil people and forces lie in wait to destroy them and take over the world. Disease, politics, economics, whatever. No matter the country or people, fear is a tool that moves the masses. That's why on this channel we like to be more ethical and keep our focus on real life dangers, people, places, and things that pose an actual existential threat to humanity. For instance, dinosaurs. No one ever talks about dinosaurs and how at any moment they could come knocking on your door to take away your children and money. There's so many popular conspiracies floating around nowadays to explain the mysterious happenings of various incidents throughout history. Who built the pyramids? Who shot JFK? Did American astronauts really land on the moon? There's all of these puzzling events that inspire so many creative and fantastical explanations. And yet, almost no one ever implicates dinosaurs in any of them. Did Epstein really kill himself, or was it a professional hit job? Or might I suggest that it could have been a velociraptor? Listen, the point of all this is that dinosaurs are dangerous. And even if just taking a quick trip to the store or dropping your kids off at school, you have to keep your guard up and watch out for those vicious ancient predators. This is precisely the reason why today, we are going to offer you some tips for surviving Jurassic Park. Park, the very place where dinosaurs were reintroduced into the world after millions of years of extinction. Now, some of you are probably going to point out that the best advice for surviving Jurassic Park is to just simply not go to the park, and fair, you have a point there. However, I can't really blame anyone for going. I mean, ask yourself, if you had the opportunity to do so, would you really not go to a theme park with real-life dinosaurs? Come on now, you would, I would, we all would, and we'd try to feed them and taunt them despite the science telling us not to. As a matter of fact, I don't even really blame John Hammond, the park's founder, for bringing dinosaurs to life. In the same way that I can't fault humans for proceeding with little caution through the ring gate system, so too can I not hold Hammond's ambition against him. Shut up about the expanse. Anyway, the point is, it's nearly impossible to prevent humans from obliging their impulse to explore the universe around them and discover and create things for the sake of their own egos. Oh, don't get me wrong, Hammond is a psychopath. I mean, he was starting to become unstable and seethe with rage when the scientists he compelled to come to his park weren't just readily endorsing his creation. However, in a bit of a discomforting way, without megalomaniacal psychopaths like Hammond, we'd also have no cool energy-efficient cars or a revived space program. How can we stand in the light of discovery and, and not act? Yeah, I get you, you little demonic lunatic, you. Anyway, I think it's fair to say that people are always going to go to Jurassic Park, so it's best to know how to be prepared in the situation that there's some sort of system-wide crash and the dinos get free. The first thing I want to discuss is transportation. You're going to want a four-wheel drive off-road capable vehicle, obviously, and from the very beginning, Hammond did plan to provide this to his guests, as we see with the park's iconic Jeeps. Here's the thing, Jeeps are not T-Rex rated as far as I know. It kind of seems like Hammond's main concern when it came to park transportation
transportation was that the vehicles could traverse all types of terrain. He didn't seem to plan for dinosaur attacks. I suppose he just trusted the park's security system. To be fair, most modern day zoos don't exactly provide secure transportation for travel around their exhibits. And I believe I've seen videos of safaris in Africa that just use jeeps as well. However, T-Rexes are at a different level of predator than lions and tigers. They're much more massive and powerful. That said, the jeep will suffice to some degree as long as it doesn't stop working. Still, when stuck in the park with dinos on the loose, you're best off finding the most fortified vehicle you can, even if that means not taking the fastest vehicle. Eventually, you'll have to slow down or run out of gas, and at that point, you don't want a dinosaur to crush you to death. Now, obviously, Jurassic World kind of solved this whole issue with the gyrospheres, but I mean, then you become a dino soccer ball, which isn't entirely fun either. Now, what happens when you do get stuck? Well, I think my biggest issue with how Dr. Grant and crew went out to the park is that they did so without supplies. I mean, they were some of the first outside visitors to the park. They didn't know if everything was going to work or not. I'm glad that Muldoon had a shotgun. That seems like a pretty decent weapon to arm the park's guards with, but it just seems like there probably should have been more of those to go around. Every tour group should be accompanied by an armed guard in case things go wrong. And my advice to you is to refuse to go into the park without weapons. And yeah, I'm not promising that a shotgun is going to do the job against the T-Rex, but perhaps at best it can inflict enough damage to get the T-Rex to leave you alone and go after your friends instead. In any case, it's not practical to have to lug an M134 minigun with you, so shotguns and rifles will have to do. That said, perhaps some of you weapons experts out there can let us know in the comments down below which firearms you think would be best for defending yourself in Jurassic Park. Aside from weapons, don't go out there without food and drink either in case you do get stuck. The car is actually a pretty safe place, it seems. It's a well-fortified mobile base. And it will provide decent protection against dinosaurs not named T-Rex. Though in the case of the T-Rex, Dr. Grant and his crew probably would have been just fine had no one gotten out of their car, which is a cardinal rule for surviving Jurassic Park. Never leave your vehicle. Almost every time someone gets out of the damn Jeeps, when the dinos are on the loose, things go wrong. The wooden hut bathroom is not a superior fortification to a car. Though to be fair, the T-Rex's adept sense of smell might have led her to the foul stench of the blood-sucking lawyer no matter where he went. Actually, on a side note, if you really think about it, the T-Rex in Jurassic Park has had her reputation unfairly besmirched over the years. All she did was eat the lawyer and the velociraptors. Yeah, she tried to kill the kids too, but that should teach the younglings to think about the company they keep next time. I can't fault the T-Rex for associating the kids with a lawyer or their grandfather who keeps her locked behind an electric fence. Oh, that reminds me, by the way, when trapped in the park, you're not going to want to hang around weaker individuals unless you plan on using them as bait. I mean, Dr. Grant could have much more easily escaped the T-Rex had it not been for the kids. Sorry, I'm not trying to be mean, and I'm glad he saved them. He's a hero for it, but we're talking about survival here. The one thing they should have at least prepared the kids with before sending them into the park is knowledge about what to do in the case of emergency, aka the dinos break loose. This was another safety oversight on the part of Hammond and his team. If only the little girl knew not to shine a light directly at the T-Rex as a way of trying to scare it away. Though to be fair, that kind of genius thinking probably can't be easily untaught. So stay in the car and don't leave the doors open either. Apparently the Dilophosaurus likes to ride shotgun. But what happens if you do get out of the car and are confronted by a dinosaur? As Dr. Grant always advises in the case of the T-Rex, stay still. That way it can't see you. The only problem with this is that scientists think that this probably isn't true, and that the T-Rex probably had excellent vision, possibly even better than modern day hawks and eagles. But hey, maybe if you freeze it'll just think you're a statue or not a threat and leave you be. Just hope that it isn't hungry. And that seems to work best when it comes to escaping the completely inaccurate looking velociraptors in Jurassic Park. I'm not trying to suggest that humans have much of a chance to outrun raptors, but it is their best chance. Try to quickly get away and hide in some small inaccessible space. Still, the goal should be to never expose yourself to dinosaurs. Do not walk out into the open where you make yourself vulnerable to stampedes and are a sitting duck to predators. At the same time, don't go into the bush. Humans are physically inferior to dinosaurs in terms of both agility and senses. In thick jungle with all sorts of obstructing plants, uneven and rough ground, and a lack of light, dinosaurs gain the upper hand. You want to, as often as possible, remain in familiar, predictable, easy to traverse territory, and of course, ideally, somewhere fortified. Oh, in Jurassic Park specific rule, when in an enclosed space, if possible, lock the doors because Jurassic Park raptors are smart enough to turn door handles. Okay, two other pieces of survival advice I might suggest based on personal observation. First, if stuck in the park with dinosaurs on the loose, it might be worth it to try to hunt some wildlife. Having some meat on hand to keep the carnivores sated could be a good idea. That said, as mentioned in the movie, the T-Rex wants to hunt. 
fun. So this isn't a surefire strategy, but it's worth a shot. The other thing you might want to do is hang around herbivores. The humans in Jurassic Park seem to come under less threat when around the massive Brachiosauruses. Herbivores pose little threat to you and will either keep carnivores at bay or provide a superior meal option over your small, unappetizing, meatless frame. No offense. Wait a minute, what if Jurassic Park is an allegory about veganism? Think about it, the whole time it's the herbivores in the movie that are nice and friendly, while the carnivores hunt the humans. But in the end, it's the T-Rex that saves the humans from the Velociraptors. Thus, we need carnivores to protect us from carnivores. Well, maybe I'm getting a bit carried away here, and we should save this for another video. Welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. Today we're going to be continuing our How to Survive series by looking at the Attack on Titan franchise. This video, as usual, will be split into four sections, starting off with some background information about the world you'll be traveling to. Then we'll be looking at the enemies you'll be facing, followed by the training and equipment you'll need, followed by how to actually survive a situation like Attack on Titan. The world of Attack on Titan is a very unique one. It's a mixture of Japanese anime, steampunk, and turn-of-the-century Bavarian architecture and design. Now, we'll try to keep any major spoilers out of this video so you guys can check the series out yourselves. I highly recommend it. But basically, in Attack on Titan, a large group of isolated humans live in a huge territory, which is separated by three massive walls that are positioned like rings. The outermost one is known as Wall Maria, and it surrounds the entire human territory, which is around 700,000 square kilometers. That's roughly around the size of Afghanistan. Only about 1.25 million people live inside of this human territory, with most of their numbers concentrated in cities that are built right into the walls. At each major gate in the wall, there usually is a large city as well, with a garrison of troops armed with wall-mounted cannons. The rest of the population live in smaller villages, which are scattered around the inner areas of the walls, and they focus on agrarian pursuits or hunting and gathering. The richest and most powerful individuals live inside the innermost wall known as Wall Sina. This included the king. Now, the majority of the area inside the walls were temperate forests mixed with an assortment of plains and mountains. The temperatures rarely exceeded the mid-80s here, and during the winter it snowed quite frequently, especially in the more northern and mountainous areas. There were no deserts in the human territory, and most of the land was pretty fertile and full of natural resources. It was generally a pretty good place to live from an environmental standpoint, although there was one small problem, which we'll mention later. The walls that surrounded the human territory were one of the most important parts of their culture. As a matter of fact, the Church of the Wall is the single largest religion in the human territories. These wallists worship the wall as a sacred and pure object. The fact that no one really remembers who built the walls in the first place only adds to the zeal of their followers. Not every human is a wallace, of course, but almost everyone is grateful for the wall's presence because of the evil threat that waits outside of the walls. The Titans are these very terrifying, human-looking giants. But that spark of humanity we all have is completely missing in their eyes. And that's because most of these Titans are mindless animals, driven by one desire, to kill humans and shove them into their stomachs. The common mindless Titan can grow anywhere from 2 meters tall to 15 meters tall. There are also specialized Titans, which we will mention, that are far larger. All of these monsters roam around naked, but lack genitalia and nipples, so now you can't milk them, Fokker. Neither would you want to, because all titans have freakishly large mouths full of square teeth that can easily chop a man in half. We don't really know how the titans are created, and they're unlike anything else in nature. They were incredibly light, which allowed them to move quite fast if they wanted to, and when they expended a lot of energy, they would actually produce a huge amount of heat, which sometimes could even burn off their flesh. The titans seem to gain all of their energy from the sun. When placed in the shade, they become inactive and will eventually die. As we said before, the pure titans were pretty stupid. They didn't communicate with one another, and they were really easy to trick. Their entire purpose was basically pursuing humans and trying to eat them. But the thing is, their stomach-like cavity does not actually digest humans, and after a titan has filled up their stomach with broken human bodies, they usually just regurgitate everything and continue eating more humans. Gotta love the Japanese and their nihilism. To make things worse, they had organs, but none of them were vital to their survival. As a matter of fact, they didn't even breathe. So while they looked like giant humans on the outside, inside no one really knew how they worked. Which was a huge problem when you were trying to kill them. Not only did titans ignore most wounds you and I would consider fatal, they could also quickly regenerate limbs, pieces of their torso, even their head. Now the only way you could really kill a titan is by attacking their nape area, right along their spine and the back of their neck. 
Once the nape was destroyed either with explosives, projectiles, or even melee weapons, the Titan would die, and their entire body would just evaporate. Which is why we know nothing about their bodies, it's very hard to perform an autopsy on a pile of ash. Now, there were abnormal titans that actually acted quite differently from what we've mentioned before. These abnormal titans were generally more intelligent and aware of their surroundings. They also had special abilities which really would separate them from the rank and file titans. Some had animal-like features or weirdly proportioned body parts, others could even talk. Then there were the nine legendary titans. These titans had human level intelligence and each one of them had a set of special skills. First, you had the Colossal Titan, who was higher than the walls themselves. He was so massive that whenever he exerted himself, he would also let out a huge cloud of scalding steam. This is a pretty effective defensive measure against humans aiming for his nape. The Armor Titan was covered in bone, like armored plates that protected crucial areas of his body. Then there was the Beast Titan, who was covered in fur and had a terrific arm and enjoyed throwing giant handfuls of boulders at humans, which of course caused massive amounts of damage. Legends say there's even one Titan that can control all other Titans. He could be the key to saving humanity. These nine Titans were pretty rare though, and if you ever see one, my recommendation is to get out of there as soon as possible. You will not survive. Now, the human military is split into three different factions. You have the military police, the garrison regiment, and also the scout regiment. Every cadet goes through the cadet corps, which involves basic training and an introduction to the most important tool an individual will use when fighting a titan, the omnidirectional mobility gear. Although the human defenders have access to muzzle-loaded artillery pieces, the most effective way to kill a titan is getting close and using a sharp blade to attack their nape. Even though the artillery shells were capable of taking out a titan, they were nowhere near as mobile and they're best suited for fortification defense. The omnidirectional mobility gear can allow a human to get relatively close to a titan. It includes a piston shot grapple hook along with a gas powered thruster system that propels you in the air once you've latched onto something. The omnidirectional mobility gear can be used to scale buildings, walls, trees, and even titans themselves if you're in an open area. This allows you to get the proper attack angle when you're going after a titan's nape. Once you get there, you have two swords with blades made of ultra hard steel that can penetrate deep inside the titan's flesh. These swords do have sections that break off in the same way an X-Acto knife does. Each soldier carries multiple blades. An experienced soldier can use the omnidirectional mobility gear to make quick work of even the larger 15 meter high titans. Without this gear or without gas, the power of the gear, you're basically stuck and completely screwed. Now the top 10 cadets in each class get to choose which regiment they want to join. The military police has always been seen as the most preferable regiment because they are located in the innermost part of the territory within Walsina. The military police are tasked with keeping the peace and protecting the loyal family. It's considered one of the best jobs in the military and it guaranteed your safety in one of the best parts of the human territory. The garrison regiment was by far the largest group. These individuals manned the cannons and gates of the three walls of humanity. This was still considered a relatively safe job because most of these individuals were stationed on top of impenetrable walls. The scout regiment was by far the most dangerous group to volunteer for. I highly recommend you do not join them. Unlike the other regiments, they actually venture out from the protection of the wall and carry out titan destroying patrols and also scout for any problematic groups of titans. Because all the terrain surrounding the human territory is flat, most scout patrols are done using horses and wagons. Just because I'm saying you shouldn't join the scouts does not mean I do not respect them. They are definitely the most talented and brave individuals in the military and they are the only ones consistently fighting the titans and training with their mobility gear. But their death rate was extremely high, especially when patrols were caught in the open without vertical objects to scale with their omnidirectional gear. There is one benefit to being a scout. You got to leave the confines of Walmaria, something that no other human was really allowed to do. So this is gonna be pretty straightforward, guys. You're gonna wanna avoid the scout regiment. Especially in the latter seasons, they were suffering almost 100% casualties at each battle. As cool as the omnidirectional gear is, it's a terrible way to fight a giant monster. Don't get me wrong, it's great for offensive attacks, but the reality is this kind of attack is very costly and exposes all of your soldiers to death and destruction. Not something you really want to do if you're waging a long-term war. One of the biggest weaknesses with the gear is that once a person shoots a grapple line out, they pretty much are stuck on a flat straight line approach, something that is very easy to cut off, especially when you're facing a giant titan. Of course, more experienced individuals could switch directions in midair, but you'll most likely die before you get that good. 
And while the scout leaders meant well, they've also become way too accepting of casualties. Instead of trying to change up their tactics to decrease casualties, they kind of just accept them in a very Japanese nihilistic way. I know they had the long range patrol formations and a few other strategies, but I argue that a lot of these things are quite ineffective. The long range patrol formation actually needlessly increases your patrol's footprint. It actually increases the amount of Titans you'll face instead of decreasing it. You're actually much better off doing well in cadet school and then joining perhaps the military police or even the garrison regiment rather than joining the scout regiment. I mean, these might be boring jobs, but for those of you who have never had an extremely dangerous and exciting job, well, the truth is moments before you realize you're about to die. Witness me. Witness me. Witness me. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben. Oh, to be in the world of yesterday. The days when we could, you know, go outside, eat in restaurants, cough on our friends without care. Those days are over, my brethren. Now we wait as the world around us crumbles, as society collapses. Well, actually, the world will probably go back to normal in a few months, and most of you will only be a few hundred cup of noodles worse for the wear, and plus, uh, that'd be true for a lot of you anyway. But just in case this is only the beginning of the end of days and society is about to fall apart, well, there's good news. Almost every study shows that in times of severe social and cultural disruption, humans tend to come together and act cooperatively with each other to keep everyone alive and safe. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. No, no study shows that. Uh, people outside the social contract are f***ing nuts. I've seen this movie already many times, and I know exactly how this goes down. Post-apocalyptic wasteland filled with unspeakable brutality where one of either Kevin Costner or Mel Gibson is our only hope. And I have spent the past few days in a deep, meditative study of the world of dystopian films. Movie after movie, the task of post-apocalyptic exegesis has taken a toll on my mind and soul. But despite hoarding Nerf guns and eating my neighbors, I'm mostly keeping it together. Witness me. Witness me. Well, at least keeping it together well enough to bring you this starter's guide for surviving the apocalypse. The first area to cover is community. When society breaks down, you're going to have to decide who you want to be and where you want to go in the dying world. There are three main options here. The first option is to go solo. I'd really only recommend this for very self-sufficient people, people who have the will and skills to survive on their own, some of which we will go over later. If you're someone who is used to being taken care of, this option is probably not for you. The advantage to going solo, of course, is that you only have to worry about yourself. You only need to procure enough food, water, and other essentials for one person. And furthermore, you only have to worry about protecting yourself from danger, which often comes naturally for a self-sufficient person. No doubt having a spouse and child during the apocalypse is an inconvenience. Max Rokitansky had a wife and infant to take care of in a dystopian Australia filled with murderous gangs, and such was not an easy task. Of course, Max didn't make it any easier by being utterly stupid. He let his wife go off on her own not once, not twice, but three times within a single day, and each time psychotic criminals attempted to rape and murder her. A big no-no for getting through the apocalypse is letting vulnerable loved ones go off on their own. But I digress. If you do go solo, you don't really want to completely isolate yourself. Set up a network of places and people you can use for resources and shelter if need be. Going off to a desolate area where you don't know or trust anyone is a recipe for disaster in a world with criminal gangs run amok looking for lone targets to prey on. Finally, if as a solo traveler you are in need of companionship, then one really good option is getting a dog. Dogs are low maintenance, will eat just about anything, and can help you along the way. The second option, as I alluded to already, is to join or build a community and blockade it. A good choice for those who do better in groups. In this scenario, the collective makes everyone in the group stronger as people bring their skills and resources together to serve all. Ideally, the community would be founded in an area with access to oil and water as to be able to survive without having to leave the community's walls very often. The downside of this option is that while in the community, you're kind of a sitting duck. This is especially true for a community that has successfully hoarded resources, as such will certainly attract the attention of raiders. Gated communities should make sure to have a plethora of arms on hand to protect their denizens. And the leaders of said communities should have an escape plan in place should the town be penetrated and overrun. 
Additionally, in the community scenario, you would be subject to the needs, preferences, and ultimately decisions of others. Even if you're the community leader, this is true. Sometimes the poor choices of others in the community or the weak members of the community can put you in a vulnerable position. The third and final option is to join a gang. Obviously, this is a version of the community option, but in this case, you're probably going to be more mobile and are going to have to do unscrupulous things in order to procure resources. In other words, this option is mostly for the sociopaths among us who are willing to prey on others in order to thrive. The major upside to this option is obviously the strength of the group. Gangs engender fear among the masses and most people will bend to their will and provide them what they demand. The downside of the gang option is that you yourself will probably be put in danger often. And your welfare won't necessarily be the greatest concern of the psychopaths around you who eventually might get you killed for frivolous reasons. That said, in doing so, you'll get to say cool shit like, Witness me! Witness! Witness! The second area to talk about is transportation. Now, if you put down roots in a gated community, you might not require mobility. But if you're exposed to the wild post-apocalyptic expanse, you will learn quickly that a man's vehicle is his key to survival. Cars reign supreme during an apocalypse. Don't get me wrong, I love motorcycles, and they do play an important role in a dystopian world. They're cheap, easier to build and fix than cars, require less fuel, and most important of all, are agile and can go off-road. A must in a world full of chaos and where roads are not often maintained. But they're also somewhat easy to take out and the riders themselves are exposed. Now, cars might lack the strengths I mentioned for motorcycles, but they're also forts that protect their riders from the elements and other people. The ideal for the post-apocalyptic traveler is to have an all-terrain militarized vehicle that can take a heavy beating and also leave the pavement if need be. A really good option is a two-man vehicle with a gunner turret so that one person can drive and the other can shoot. This setup is apt for the post-apocalyptic highway. As for vehicle no-nos, do not get out of your car in a desolate or unfamiliar area. As a matter of fact, when in transit, do not stop and get out of your car unless you absolutely have to. And for fuck's sake, do not stop your car for a beautiful woman in distress. Listen to me, listen closely. If you are driving along and you spot a naked woman calling for help, it is, well, let me bring in a special correspondent here. Akbar? It's a trap! Thanks, Admiral. Yes, number one safety rule of the post-apocalyptic world, naked women are traps. Flying vehicles are, of course, an extreme luxury in the apocalypse, and if you can procure one, you are very lucky, because flying will allow you to avoid the most dangerous area in a dystopian world, land. By the way, in a post-apocalyptic world, water can be a very dangerous place too, and the same vehicle rules apply. Those who have the strongest, fastest boats will stand the best chance of survival, and don't get out of your boat in desolate areas either because, well, you'll drown. The third area we have to talk about is weapons, which in a dystopian world become essential tools of survival. Not carrying a gun in the apocalypse is a death wish because the bad guys will have guns and will use them to enforce their will on the vulnerable. That said, in a post-apocalyptic world, I imagine gun production will decrease drastically or possibly even cease which means it'll be harder to come by and thus other forms of weapons will regain importance. Of course, if 3D printing becomes mainstream before the apocalypse, then this is a moot point and the post-apocalyptic world is going to be ratchet and clank. But if not, having a bladed weapon on your person should be a standard rule for the post-apocalyptic traveler. Not only can a knife provide protection, but it doubles as a tool. Any weapon you can carry on you and that won't slow you down too significantly is worth bringing along. And considering that vehicles will be used as weapons in a dystopian world, explosives are a valuable commodity. Weapons then relate to the fourth area we have to talk about, which is knowledge and skills. Obviously, having weapons is one thing, but knowing how to use them is another. And he who can adeptly wield guns and knives will be best protected. Technical know-how will go a long way in the post-apocalyptic world. You won't just be able to order everything you need off of Amazon. Jeff Bezos will be too busy being an evil people-eating warlord to worry about your same-day delivery. Thus, being able to rig weapons from everyday materials and knowing how to engineer explosions from scratch are priceless pieces of knowledge in the post-apocalyptic world. And from observation, knowing how to drive a truck is an off-needed skill. So get your commercial driver's licenses, people. Next week, you might have to steer a big rig through a sandstorm. Listen, do you see how even during this temporary disruption to our lives during the outbreak of COVID-19, people are freaking out about getting what they need to survive? In the post-apocalyptic world, those who can make and do will thrive. Having a car or a boat is one thing, but there won't be many mechanic shops along the road in a dystopian world. So knowing how to fix vehicles yourself is of utmost importance. Combat skills are great, but honestly, they'll only get you so far. And eventually, in the real world, without plot armor, you could die in any fight if someone just shoots you once. 
But if you know how to build, say, ships, people will be much more likely to want to keep you around. Such knowledge could potentially help you survive way better than a gun might. Furthermore, in a world where paper currency has lost its value, food resources and material goods will take on newfound importance in a barter economy. Thus, knowing how to hunt and sow will get you far. The hierarchy of professions will see radical reorganization in a post-apocalyptic world. A blacksmith will likely become more important than an accountant, but still perhaps not more important than a doctor. Hard to predict. And by the way, if technology falters during the apocalypse, there will be no more Google to provide you with an on-demand encyclopedia. Just knowing things, any knowledge will take on greater value. Being multilingual, for instance, will be of great service to you in a world without electronic translation. Now, with everything said for the importance of knowledge in a crumbling dystopian world, the importance of physical size will actually gain traction on the value of intelligence. Let's be real, the only reason that big people in our world don't kill and eat the rest of us is because of the power of law. But without the social contract, the giants among us will much more readily dominate people. The trick in the post-apocalyptic world will be to combine brains and brawn, as we saw with Master Blaster and Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Finally, the last area we have to cover is mentality. Again, you see how people are freaking out about just not having toilet paper? Well, this kind of weakness is exactly what will get you killed in the apocalypse. The society we live in is a bubble, shielding us from the brutality of the world and human nature. Outside of the social contract, the fragility of life becomes much more obvious, and you must toughen up in order to survive. You have to harden yourself. You have to learn to experience terrible things and quickly move on. You're going to witness constant injustice happen to innocents, and if you try and fight every battle, you're not going to make it. Sometimes you'll have to turn your head and just keep going. You're going to have to do tough things in order to survive. No more abundant choices. Life is Cuba now. You're going to have to strengthen your constitution and eat whatever is available to you. In the post-apocalyptic world, you have to strip your thinking down to a very simple state and only focus on what is needed for survival. A perfectly moderated mind is key, with just the right balance of faith versus rationality, patience versus decisiveness, and trust versus suspicion to survive. You want to be brave, but maybe have just the right touch of fear to keep you from doing this. You might as well start training yourself now. Steal your mind so that by June, you will be ready to ride eternal, shiny and chrome, and I myself will carry you to the gates of Valhalla. Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan, and today we're going to be continuing our How to Survive series with the very underrated Battle Los Angeles. Based on a true story, this film gives us an in-depth look at how the U.S. military would respond to an all-out alien invasion on our west coast. As always, this video will be separated into four different sections. First, we're going to be looking at the background of the battle, the location where it's taking place. Then we'll be looking at the enemy combatants, followed by the type of equipment and training you should bring along with you, followed by how you can survive this kind of engagement. August 12, 2011, several meteors are detected on a collision course with Earth. Most of these meteors are projected to land near major coastal cities. Because these projectiles were detected at the last second, evacuations are called only as the meteors make their final approach. But before striking the surface at terminal velocity, these objects actually slow down on their own, which shows us that they potentially could be manned. Soon after touchdown of these objects, alien forces emerge out of the impact zones across the planet and start a worldwide textbook military invasion. Their primary goal is to establish beachheads all across the planet and cut humanity off from the coast. Humanity's defenders are initially caught off guard, but quickly mobilized to counter the enemy threat. Although the aliens' weapons and technology were more advanced than ours, they weren't invincible and our soldiers could still take them down. But because these aliens were able to arrive onto our planet pretty much undetected, major city centers were not evacuated completely and high civilian casualties and damage to the infrastructure are expected. Los Angeles, which is known for having terrible traffic, becomes one giant war zone full of refugees trying to flee eastwards. With so many civilians still in the city, each infantry fighter on the ground also doubles as a first responder to a major disaster. Los Angeles Beach is quickly overrun. 
aside from the gym rats at Muscle Beach and the crazy cyclists who think they're Lance Armstrong. The alien landing forces face very little resistance, and 100 miles to the south, San Diego is overrun, and 400 miles to the north, San Francisco is also overrun. Los Angeles Command is the last known standing force on the west coast, and it is extremely important that they are able to hold on. This will give the rest of the U.S. military time to regroup for a counterattack. Luckily for Los Angeles, just south of the city is Camp Pendleton, one of the largest marine training bases in the country. And as we all know, there is no better killer of extraterrestrials than a human marine. Very little is known about these aliens, but they clearly are more advanced than humanity. After all, they are spacefaring species and able to hide their approach to our planet with some kind of advanced stealth technology. They are bipedal and roughly the same height as humans, but their anatomy is quite different from Mars and highly evolved or perhaps modified for combat purposes. First, their bodies are covered in a hardened exoskeleton, which allows them to easily absorb multiple 5.56 rounds before getting knocked out. Internally, their bodies are covered in redundant arteries and blood vessels. They also have clumps of stem cells, which can regenerate limbs and heal gruesome injuries. What looks like a head is actually one giant sensory organ, and their brains are actually located in their chest behind their hearts. All of the fighters are further heavily modified with a variety of different bolt-on machines. This includes communication devices, cooling systems, and weapons attachments. The alien soldiers are separated into four different casts. The infantry casts are the most common. These aliens are slender and stand at around eight foot tall. On each arm, they have weapons grafted to them. It's said that the alien invasion included 25 million of these infantry soldiers. Leading them in small squads were the officer casts, who were generally taller and had augmented brains and keen eyesight to allow them to better lead their soldiers into combat. Then you had the smaller operations cast, which served as combat engineers, and the intelligence cast, who gathered information on humanity. The aliens also deployed combat medics, so there is an emphasis on recovering injured soldiers. The alien infantry is armed with grafted-on hand cannons, which fire projectiles in a similar way to a railgun. Most of these weapons platforms also have underslung grenade launchers or anti-personnel rockets. Some infantry units are deployed with a walking gun, which provides artillery and indirect fire support. For air support, the aliens have drone ships that are extremely maneuverable and use pulse jets to either hover or move around like a more traditional aircraft. The drones are quickly able to control airspace over Los Angeles, putting humanity at a huge disadvantage. Still, despite their advanced technology, their weapons and vehicles seem to be slapped together and relatively old. There are some theories that these aliens have just escaped some terrible war from their own home planet and now are running low on resources, which kind of explains the state of their equipment. It could also explain why the alien forces lack more heavy vehicles and heavy weapons. Now, the alien military strangely functions in a very similar way to our own. They have a clear chain of command. Their military force is separated into small units, which are effectively led by junior officers who all have their own objectives. The alien commanders were capable enough to launch an invasion on Earth without us even realizing what's going on. On the ground, they favored using their maneuverability and element surprise to quickly overwhelm enemy forces. This could also be why there are very few heavy vehicles in their arsenal. Mostly what we see are just light alien infantry. They're basically armed like a very light expeditionary force. This is also why the aliens have to rely heavily on drone support to take out and pin down human heavy armor. And once that air support is gone, the aliens aren't able to operate nearly as effectively. The U.S. Marines are a light infantry fighting force at their core. This is built into every aspect of how they are trained, deployed, and equipped. Compared to their Army counterparts, the Marines are more dependent on the individual riflemen. This is why Marine rifle squads are generally larger and include three fire teams. Although the Marines are well-versed in combined arms tactics because they are considered an expeditionary force, they generally have less heavy weapons and fire support at the small unit level. A much heavier emphasis is put on the individual rifleman and his or her ability as a marksman. In an urban combat situation like Los Angeles, the Marines are more likely to go house to house engaging in CQB with small arms rather than using artillery or tanks to destroy enemy positions from afar. And in this case, against an alien force with superior technology and complete dominance of the airspace, having a force that is essentially designed to fight low tech and without vehicular supports, if necessary, is an advantage for the Marines. This is only compounded by their warrior-like mentality and culture, which is probably why the Marines are able to take the news that they are fighting aliens so calmly. To them, it's just another enemy to outsmart and kill. 
As far as equipment goes, the Marines are deployed with M16s, M4s, and M249 saws. Although these weapons are able to take down enemy combatants, it seems like the enemy exoskeletons are able to absorb multiple rifle rounds. A large caliber round or an armor-piercing round might be more effective in this type of situation. The Marine's body armor also seems to be quite effective at stopping enemy rounds. Because this is an urban environment, I do recommend doubling up on those trauma plates, because again, the aliens are using freaking railguns. I also recommend you keep your pack lights other than ammo and weapons. You can find food, water, and anything else you need on the battlefield because you are in a major American city. Make sure your gear is also prepared for tight urban spaces. Zip tie or dummy cord down anything that is loose and keep those radio antennas folded down. Look, no matter what, this is going to be a terrible situation for you. You're going to be in a target-rich environment full of friendly civilians. Your job is to extract those civilians and engage the technologically and numerically superior enemy with complete control of the airspace. So, my advice in these kind of terrible situations, which can be applied to almost anything in life, is, uh, you know, fall back to your training and then focus on just one objective at a time. Let's go over some basics here for operations in urban terrain. Spacing and communications are extremely important in this kind of environment. This is going to be a very complicated 3D environment with a lot of verticality and plenty of ambush points. One lone rifleman will not be able to cover every angle and vector, so make sure you stay alert and disciplined and move well as a team. Avoid bunching up, and when advancing down a street, stay away from the walls, as counterintuitive as that might seem. Take special precaution when crossing doorways, alleys, and especially intersections. Be prepared at all times for incoming sniper fire and be prepared to carry out counter sniper fire drills and extract your team from an ambush point. When moving from one location to another, keep your head on a swivel and scan the sectors you are assigned to. Also, make sure to always know where the nearest exit and cover is in case you are immediately ambushed. You're going to be at a severe disadvantage and you will have limited fire support and heavy weapons at your disposal. Because of the enemy's air superiority, keeping off of major avenues and highways will be essential to your survival. I recommend you keep the secondary roads and if necessary make your own entrances and exits through buildings and walls so you can avoid deadly intersections and potential ambush points. Because you are outnumbered and manpower is limited, there will be no traditional front line. No clearing houses and occupying them and securing your rear. Expect to be engaged from all sides. The only safe place is your fob and that's many miles away. Getting bogged down in this kind of environment most likely will lead to the destruction of your entire unit. So always be ready to exit a location and use whatever methods possible to disengage from combat. Also remember the aliens are not familiar with your surroundings. Use your knowledge of human cities to your advantage. Know that gas stations can be used to create massive explosions. Use your knowledge of cars to know exactly where you can take cover behind one, near the front where the engine block is. Use your knowledge of the subway system and sewers so that you can bypass enemies from underground or use your knowledge of the rooftops to bypass the enemies from above. Be realistic and cautious when exposing yourself and engaging enemy forces. You will have limited backup and your enemy is heavily armed and will outnumber you. They're also quicker and more mobile than your own marines. Now, usually we recommend you guys act like cowards and immediately run away from the fighting, but that's usually in pointless battles against other humans where you're fighting over resources or political ideology. But in this case, you are defending Earth against uh, aliens, so, you know, it's actually pretty important that you do stand up and fight. In my opinion, you can do whatever you want. Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. The apes of the mobile infantry are the thin armored lion that protects humanity from the terrifying arachnids. Now I know on this channel we've talked a lot about the humanity first ideology and this has attracted a lot of young men and women who are basically willing to sacrifice everything in order to unite humanity against any incoming Xeno threats. Which means that a lot of our viewers would probably be very eager to fulfill their citizen duty by joining the mobile infantry and fighting the arachnids on the front line. But it would kind of be immoral for me not to prepare you guys for the horrors of the human arachnid wars. I know a lot of the propaganda footage from the United Citizen Federation sugarcoats things and makes joining the mobile infantry look awesome, but the reality is filled with a bit more nuance and gore. And so today we'll be going over several tips that will help you survive the mobile infantry. Cue the epic intro.
So the Mole Infantry is a purely voluntary force. While this is recommended compared to a construct force, which is usually full of individuals who don't actually want to be there. There is a caveat with the volunteer aspect of the Mobile Infantry. It's not exactly what you would think. You see, in the United Citizen Federation, there are citizens and civilians. Although technically speaking, civilians are not discriminated against and basically treated like equals, they aren't really equal. Now, one can only become a citizen by joining the military. Citizens, therefore, have additional benefits, including more easy access to birth licenses, and only citizens are allowed to vote and also run for government positions. It's a pretty fascist society in some ways. Everything is geared towards military service, and so generally, everyone who is ambitious and doesn't want to be judged by their peers will volunteer for the Federal Armed Service. So yeah, depending on where you are, you're gonna see a lot of scrubs basically make it into the mobile infantry and federal armed services. Unlike here in the United States, where military service is quite rare amongst the general population and generally attracts some very upstanding individuals, especially those who have a preference for munching on crayons. So the first question you have to really ask yourself is, is it worth it for you to join the federal armed service? This really depends on what your life goals are and whether you want to take advantage of the uh, advantages you get as a citizen. Also, you have to really clearly think about um, which branch of the federal military service you're going to join. You have to be realistic with your own physical and mental capabilities because that is going to be a big factor here. When it comes to applying to the Federal Armed Services, your performance and intelligence as a human being is going to be looked at. Before becoming a civilian, one has to take the Civilian Aptitude Exam, which is a series of written physical and oral examinations to determine how you will best serve in the mobile infantry. While it's incredibly hard to fail this test unless you have severe psychiatric issues, doing poorly on this test will really limit the options you'll have when joining the Federal Armed Services. And more importantly, the jobs in which you'll most likely survive will probably uh, require higher amounts of intelligence and loyalty to the Federation rather than, let's say, physical attributes like strength and agility and speed and size. They don't really care if you were a star jump ball player if you lost all your brain cells because you like to lead with your helmet. And so the best and probably safest branch of the Federal Armed Services to join would be the military intelligence. This will obviously require you to have almost genius level intellect. The elite top secret branch focuses heavily on collecting intel on the enemy, in this case arachnids, and understanding how they work so that we can develop better weapons and tactics to use against them. One military intelligence officer can essentially do the work of thousands of mobile infantrymen with one significant breakthrough, like developing a way to block the brain bug's hive mind communication abilities. Most of us unfortunately will not make it into the intelligence because we just aren't that intelligent. The next best outfit to serve in then for you is the Federation fleet. An individual still has to be pretty intelligent and have fast reaction times and good physical attributes to join up. But joining the fleet, whether you're a starfighter pilot or a weapons officer on a larger capital ship, is still going to be significantly more dangerous than being a military intelligence officer. The Battle of Klandathu is forever remembered as a terrible disaster for the mobile infantry, but a lot of people forget about the massacre that happened in space. The Federation fleet, mainly made up of Corvette transports, arrived on Klandathu in a tight formation due to faulty intel that plasma bug anti-air fire would be light. And even though the first salvo from the arachnids was indeed sporadic and failed to strike any human ships, the anti-air or space fire began to increase in accuracy and frequency and soon the closely bunched Federation fleet was having issues evading the incoming fire because of the tight formation. Several ships were destroyed by a new fire and others even collided with each other. So the danger is still there in the fleet, but it's nowhere near as dangerous as the mobile infantry. The reality is the mobile infantry is where the less intelligent and more erratic individuals will go, which is a problem and creates dependability issues in combat. So make sure to get to know your unit well and make friends with individuals who are disciplined and calm under fire. I would avoid the loud gung-ho, I want to charge at the enemy types. I would avoid psychopaths and also individuals who are kind of failures at being human beings. Even during training, casualties are expected and not uncommon, so always keep your head on a swivel and avoid individuals without basic firearm safety knowledge. Now, due to the poor quality candidates it receives, the mobile infantry heavily relies on discipline and group mentality and large parade formations in battle because the individual generally cannot be depended on. It's also usually this type of organization that leads to officers being more willing to sacrifice large amounts of troops for, you know, mission goals. Which is why you really should avoid the mobile infantry at all costs. 
The way the mobile infantry is organized might resemble a modern Western military, but in reality, most of the tactical decisions are made at the company level. There is no solid core of junior officers and non-coms directing smaller rifle squads and platoons. And if you look at the deployment of the mobile infantry on Klandathu, the mobile infantry were just randomly discharged from their dropships and then began to wander around the battlefield aimlessly. There was a clear lack of objective-oriented movement, and no perimeter was established around the landing site, and when the Arachnids swarmed the mobile infantry, they were completely overwhelmed and quickly routed, leading to over 300,000 casualties. It's questionable why the Federal Armed Service even dropped infantry on that hellhole of a planet in the first place. A better strategy would have been to just bombard that whole planet from space, or at least use mechanized infantry supported by heavy armor. So what do you do if you are in the mobile infantry and you find yourself facing an arachnid swarm? Well, the reality is arachnids are much larger and deadlier than a human being up close, and you stand very little chance of surviving, which is why you definitely should not advance and fire upon the enemy unless they are in retreat. Because the basic arachnid soldier is essentially without range weapons, your best strategy is actually to clump together and adopt volley fire strategies that were first pioneered by early gunpowder militaries here on Earth. The key to taking arachnid cords down is maintaining a continuous ring of fire. Or my favorite strategy game, They Are Billions, will know that this is exactly what you want to do. High rate of fire and minimal gaps in the fire rates. The morale of your firing line is incredibly important. It just takes one individual to break that will lead to a cascading event where your entire unit will rout. Doesn't even matter if there is an officer standing behind you with a weapon, that's how fear works. Breaks in your continuous fire will allow the enemy swarm to get closer. The closer the giant bugs get, the more stress it puts on your trooper. The more stress the trooper has, the more erratic and inaccurate his fire will be, and there will also be a higher chance of him messing up his reloads, which is another crucial part of fending off waves of anything. Trust me, I know, I'm a veteran of zombie-related VR games, and whenever uh, the zombies get too close to the firing line, people start messing up, they mess up their reload, and we wrapped. Discipline is key for your unit, which is why, again, you should surround yourself with good people. Make sure to continuously train on reloading and rank fire drills. Learn how to stagger reloads so that there is a continuous line of fire, and learn how to fire and retreat. This will create more space between you and the horde of insects. Another key component of surviving the arachnid wards is making sure that you establish your firing line in a good position. Obviously, high ground is really preferable. Look for natural geographical features like cliffs and hills to place your units on. Prepared defenses are even better. A trench line can do wonders in stopping the arachnids just enough, and a high cement wall in front of said trench will provide even more protection and help preserve the firing line's morale. So survival in the mobile infantry really depends on the quality of your unit. So you should really focus on making your unit as good as you are. This means helping the weaker individuals get up to speed. The firing line is only as strong as the weakest link, and you'll have to make a decision to either strengthen that link or accidentally fire around into the back of the link's head while your unit is in a chaotic retreat. While I recommend you guys try to join the fleet or military intelligence, but if your grades are just way too low, and you have to join the mobile infantry, these are a few of the tips that I recommend you following. Again, everything depends on the line. That is where you start and finish the battle. If the line breaks, you guys are screwed. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.